So our next speaker is Raphael Lancelotta. He is a psychotherapist focusing on using ketamine and cannabis for his therapy. Raphael. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming out. So um, there were some really amazing um, talks this morning. Those panel discussions were amazing, especially uh, Rachel's description on some of the neurobiology components. And so I'll be talking a bit more in depth um, how these, what we know about the neurobiology of the nervous system and how that can be integrated into a therapeutic context um, for treating PTSD, depression, and anxiety. So, so we'll start out with, what is psychedelic psychotherapy, right? So um, it, it's the use of a substance. Uh, it can be, there's a whole wide range, like Alex was talking about earlier today, there's a wide range of psychedelic substances that produce um, ego softening effects. Um, so psychedelic psychotherapy combines these medicines with uh, psychotherapy, which we're all pretty familiar with. So the difference here is that we, we consider these expressive medicines. So right now, um, the use of SSRIs like Prozac, for example, um, these are suppressive medicines. They suppress emotions. They suppress nervous system responses. And so they essentially um, increase the nervous system's capacity for holding symptoms at bay. Psychedelics bring those symptoms to the surface and they give people opportunities to really experience the things that are being held down, the things that are difficult to feel. Um, and so this gives us a huge advantage. And, and you know, Rachel was talking about how psychedelics give therapists a much better tool set um, in order to treat people who um, have PTSD, depression, or anxiety. So um, some of the things that are important to, to consider here, right? So, so we have to look at how the psyche is constructed. Um, so we like to use the iceberg metaphor. So, um, you know, we're, we're sitting here in this room and we're walking around. Um, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg. Beneath the surface, there are thousands of processes happening every second perhaps billions, right? Um, there's so many connections happening in your mind, so many different parts of your brain that are communicating with one another. Um, and all of the way that you're experiencing your day-to-day -day reality is structured on your past experiences. So, um, so we have to know that the, the conscious mind is just the top layer. It's just what's sitting at the very top and um, the subconscious is where most of our life experiences are stored. Um, and, and, you know, even further down, we have the, the unconscious, which, you know, in, in Freudian terms is, is really inaccessible, right? That's, that's areas that are transpersonal, right? Um, so in, in this modality of therapy, we're mo mainly using the ability to access subconscious material in order to uh, have a therapeutic benefit. So um, the, the benefits of this modality of therapy, a, a, a somatic focused therapy that encourages people to feel in their bodies, to feel emotions and to feel um, experiences that have been difficult to feel is um, you're going to see reduced compulsiveness because there's going to be more of an ability to, to sit with emotions, to be with difficult things as they arise, right? So, so people who have experienced uh, trauma oftentimes talk about triggers, right? So, so there's something in the environment that uh, reminds them of a situation, right? Or, or brings up a, uh, a physiological response. And that creates this, you know, this knee-jerk reaction, like, I need to make this go away. Um, so through this therapy and being able to actually feel through those moments of, you know, this, this emotion or this sensation that something terrible is about to happen, the ability to, be, to work through that and sit through that um, gives people more ability to, to actually engage with the present moment. Um, so you also have an increased 
access to moderate emotions, right? So, so, if you, so people who experience PTSD, they, they often just experience very extreme emotions, right? Intense fear, terror, um, in, you know, intense anxiety, um, you know, sometimes intense happiness or intense sadness, right? There, there's not really a middle ground because everything is just trying to compensate. So, um, so as people start to, to clear out their nervous systems, they start to experience um, you know, more moderate emotions like, yeah, I'm feeling pretty angry right now, but the ability to talk about it and for it to not take over and turn into rage. Um, so there's, there's uh, regaining access to sense of peace as well and, um, and a better ability to handle stress. So PTSD, it's a, it's a stress disorder. So what happens is that the stressor that someone has experienced has gone beyond their capacity to, um, to cope with it, right? And so any stressor after that point brings someone back into that place where they're, they feel they're unable to cope with it. So, um, so the ability to handle stress becomes more appropriate to the present moment. Um, so some of the risks of this therapy, right? There, there's no physical danger. We know um, cannabis and ketamine are, are really safe drugs for the most part. Um, cannabis has been used for thousands of years uh, and uh, ketamine has been used in clinical settings at much higher doses than what we're using at the clinic um, for sedation in children and in elderly people. Um, but there are emotional risks. And so that's why um, doing th this kind of work is so important to be done in a therapeutic context. So th those are the types of things that we um, are taking into account in, at the clinic. So, you know, it's, it's really attractive to think that a psychedelic is going to be a magic pill, right? That, that, you know, if I just take this drug, my PTSD is going to go away. Um, if I just do why, then it's all going to be better. The truth of it is that it's hard work. You know, the, the people that I have the privilege to work with at the clinic are some of the bravest people um, that I've ever encountered because they come week after week to feel the most difficult emotions that most people don't have to feel because they haven't experienced that level of sadness or terror or whatever else. Um, so, so it takes a deep engagement, right, for, for the therapist to be in tune and be able to hold space for that level of emotion, as well as for the client to, to actually take that step and really um, take the leap of faith and to feel those things that have been so difficult to feel. Um, and, and, you know, to know that, that these medicines catalyze this process. It's a natural process. Our bodies want to do this. Um, and because these emotions feel so scary or dangerous, um, we get really good at avoiding them. So again, you know, this is why relationship is so essential. None of these therapies would work if there wasn't a relationship. You can, you can take the drugs in isolation um, and, and you may have some insight, people have insights. Those insights are cognitive. They happen in the conscious mind. They're not oftentimes affecting the subconscious. Those lasting subconscious benefits happen when, they're, when those realizations are reinforced in relationship. So you talk to people who have had big breakthrough psychedelic experiences um, and they, they have long lasting change in their lives. I bet you, willing to bet good money, that there was someone there I bet you there was someone that supported this person or connected with this person after this experience and that became this link for this person to exist in the world again. And again, so, so this really, I think this therapy is about bringing people back together, finding connection again, learning how to be in community and be in relationship um, after experiencing something that has informed our subconscious that being in relationship and being in community is dangerous. So again, that therapeutic relationship creates the construct and the context for which people can start to trust relationship again. So in, in our clinic, we say that bad trips are good trips. 
And the reason why I say that is that you know these so-called bad trips oftentimes involve feeling all of these emotions that people say like I don't want to feel this right and and how many of us spend so much of our lives saying I don't want to feel tired I don't want to feel sad I don't want to feel angry um and so we find ways to avoid feelings we find ways to distract ourselves um but those emotions stay there they get put into the subconscious and they build up over time and they become baggage. Um, so, so know that, um, that in this process, the core programming and, and the traumas, um, you know, they, they naturally emerge. And, and I think that this process can happen without psychedelics, but like we said, you know, these psychedelics are catalyzers. They speed up this process within the right context. So um, at the clinic, we use cannabis as well as ketamine. Um, and, and even though we use the same modality, there are some slight differences between the two. So um, you know, cannabis and ketamine both allow access to the subconscious. So they, they allow us to start to process subconscious material through the body. Um, they both allow for increased body awareness. So a lot of people think, oh, well, ketamine is a dissociative. You lose bodily awareness. But um, what we're finding is that you know, people who have PTSD have high levels of dissociation in their system. And that's an involuntary thing. Their system is doing it to protect them. Um, with sub-K-hole doses of ketamine, it provides just enough dissociation to where people can start to become conscious of the dissociation. And that becoming conscious of dissociation essentially starts to deteriorate the dissociation and allows people to exist in the present moment. Um, so in, in, in contrast, um, cannabis, uh, we would call it a more direct medicine. So surprisingly, even though you know, ketamine has been seen to be so effective in um, a lot of clinics for, um, for treating PTSD or depression, um, though that window of benefits is, is about two weeks, and then people have to come back and do another ketamine session, and, and it becomes more of a maintenance therapy. So, um, so the, the, using ketamine, it's a little bit, tends to be a bit slower for people, and for some people that's better. Some people need to go slower. Some people need to take their time and know that they actually get some choice in how quickly things process. And so, so for some other people, they may be super ready. I mean, they, they have support. They have a family structure or a friend structure. They have supportive people that are, you know, right there with them. And, and they, they feel ready to feel all these difficult things. And so for those people, cannabis tends to be such a powerful catalyst because it tends to take people directly to the source of what's there and what's happening. Um, and, and again, you know, it's, it's a psychedelic that's readily available in Colorado. And it's, it's you know, we, we're waiting for MDMA, we're waiting for psilocybin, but, you know, cannabis is a medicine that in the appropriate context um, can have just as or sometimes more um, beneficial effects than some of the other medicines. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to show uh, a video of a therapy session. So uh, just to give you a little bit of context, um, the person in the video is someone who um, was friends with the, the founders of the clinic, and he had some early childhood trauma that he wanted to work through, and he wanted his process to be documented. He wanted people to be able to see what this therapy is like um, so that people could understand, because I can talk about it, but it's so different to actually see it happening. So I also want to preempt this so that, you know, for people to know, this is a therapy session. There are intense emotions, so, you know, if you feel like you need to take a break or you need to step out, feel free to do so. Um, and, you know, I just want to kind of put that disclaimer out there. Um, and as we're watching the video, I will pause and, you know, talk a little bit about what's happening and, and what, is, what are we tracking in the body uh, with this client. How do I get the, the 
video up there. <laughs> so I haven't. Oh, there it is. Okay. So then if I do this. Yeah. Thank you. So another thing to know about this, uh, this person is that, uh, so he uh, was a long-term medit, <laughs> he was a long-term meditator and, um, you know, was taught meditation classes, had run ultra marathons. So this highly disciplined um, person, super aware of his processes. So as you watch the video, you're gonna, you're gonna see him tracking um, his bodily sensations and talking about things um, and I just want you to know that this isn't um, Something that people typically are able to do right off the bat So this is this is going to be showing something that's you know at a more advanced um, place in therapy, but um, this is essentially what it looks like Oh the sound. I, the sound isn't, it's not playing sound. It's not playing a sound. Um, so while we're waiting, I can just talk a little bit about um, you know what's what's happening in the session. So, um, so in this session, he's um, he's processing somatically, and so when we talk about processing somatically, we're talking about um, rather than rather than talking about the trauma or retelling the story, um, we're just after you know after the introduction of the medicine or the administration of it. Um, we're just, um, yeah, the, the sound from the video. Yeah, if you could just get the sound. Um, so, so we're paying attention to what's the bodily sensations that are there and allowing those sensations to be there and to be felt however they are. Um, so hopefully we can, we can get it going.
got it? And I'm just gonna, just mirror these? So yeah, that yeah, that's perfect. Means it's really hard to see this, but... Uh, no, that's, that's fine. As long as we can completely open it. Pulsing and alternating hips. Mm -hmm. It's weird. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank God, I am totally in touch with sensations. Yeah. Like, intensely. Beautiful. So just keep tracking sensations. Yep, right with it. Lots of energy moving in pelvis. So notice, notice how his legs are starting to move a little bit. There's some slight shaking, right? So, so there's, he's letting his body start to move, ha let these involuntary movements happen. And notice, notice how the notice, uh, notice how the therapist is also um, keeping prompting throughout that process. So there's not like a loss of contact, right? The therapist is actively in, involved in the session. Patterning of what's going up and going down. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, it looks like uh, contractions. It's, it's contract, relax, contract, relax. Beautiful. Quick pace. Okay. So, so these movements that you're watching are involuntary, right? He's allowing his body to do this. He's, he's not doing this consciously. Um, Notice how it seems like his, his nervous system kind of went up to a state of arousal and then kind of calmed back down. So this is an, a natural nervous system process. So the, as he's processing through the, the traumatic, whatever is stored in the body, um, it comes up, it gets felt, his body releases it through whatever movement, and it starts to relax. So I'm trying to figure out where I can sit where that's not happening. Um, so, um, so I'm going to watch a bit more. Ooh. What are you most aware of right now? Cold coming down my face, tingling in both hands and arms. Whole body in it's encased in this tingly, it's like a coffin. It's just tingly. Okay. Stay right there with you. So right here he's describing tingling, cold, right? So now his nervous system is actually moving into a state of dissociation. And this is a natural thing that our bodies do. They, they, our bodies can flood themselves with endogenous opioids, right? endorphins. Um, and so that produces these feelings of, right, cold, you know, he says he feels like he's in a coffin, right? He feels dead. Um, there's no sensation. And, and notice, so in, in a lot of therapeutic modalities, when dissociation happens, um, therapists kind of back away, right? They, they just think, oh, well, the person's not present or, you know, whatever. They're, they're feeling cold and tingly. Here, you're going to notice the therapist is actually going to stay with him and try to keep bringing conscious awareness 
to that state. Great. Body is lifting up. Right arm gripped in fear. Beautiful. Let it happen. Are you feeling fear or just your arm? Yeah, I, I, feel, I sort of feel the, call it the numb. So no, or the witness. Uh-huh. So there might be fear here, but you're numb. Possibly. Okay. Yeah. I'm tightening in the throat. I'm getting pulled back. The torso is totally contracted. It's beginning to hurt. There you go, there you go. How's that numbing and the fear? Um, I can't tell what's here emotionally. Okay. Um, and I just feel calm, uh -huh. you know, present in love, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, no, no, yeah, no emotion. All body. All body. Okay. Lots of body. Yeah. Yeah, that right really arm's really going. Just pushing. Yeah. Just pushing. Yeah, just let it push. It's getting tired. Mm. Yeah, let's see what's next. Mouth is crinkling. Yeah. Um, I'm getting angry. I can't feel the anger. Yeah. But I can intuit it. Right. So you can sense it's there some way, but it's far. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Just notice that. Yeah. I'm yeah, pissed off. Okay. I can begin to feel it. Beautiful, beautiful. Can you feel the numb that's preventing you from feeling it all the way? Or you, it's hard to notice the numb? No, I can, I'm, I'm with it. Okay. I, I can feel the numb around. It's like, nah, I'm not even sure if it's a numb. Now it's like a tingle. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, other hand going. Yeah. Uh, there you go, there you go. Real that hurts the hand. Oh. Yeah, put the focus there. Let's see what it's doing. Attention to the left hand line. I'm right at it. All right. There you go. It's getting hot. It's like taking it. The sun. Yeah. So notice how as he's processing somatically, all of a sudden he's in a memory, right? So we didn't need to bring up a memory. We didn't need to actually talk through an event. His his body brought it up on its own, right? So. This is just an, some example of how our bodies really store these stress. Right? There you go. Look at all your emotions right now. Are you angry? Are you disappointed? Are you? Oh, it feels 
I'm very alive, but uh, let me let me tune into this. Okay. It's like I'm rubbing a bump, like rugged rubbing a pregnant woman. Uh huh. I'm rubbing my mom. Uh huh. You're rubbing her belly. I'm rubbing her belly. Okay. Pregnant with one of my sisters. Uh huh. Yeah, see what this means for you. It's good. Uh -huh. I'm connected with her. Okay. Does she feel like she's there? You can, you can contact her. Yeah, I can feel her. Not totally. Uh -huh. Halfway. Halfway. See what that's like. Mom's halfway there. Wish she was all the way here. You wish she was all the way here, yeah. You bet. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see what body does with this. She's halfway here. I need. Stay with neck and head. Mm. Mouth. Yeah. Mm. So I'm gonna have you just if you if you can talk then say it, but if you can't, don't worry about it. Just think it. I need. Mm. I need. I need. I need. Roach burning again. Yeah. I need. All body, all body in motion. There you go. I need her. <laughs> It's like being on a roller coaster. I definitely want to get off. Uh huh. What's so What's so hard about it? Uh, the energy. Uh huh. In my body. Uh huh. So notice how right here, there's this crucial point where, for a lot of people, if they were to experience something like this on their own, and you feel like I don't want to feel this, right? There's there's a, a impulse to get away from it. And notice how the therapeutic relationship is allowing for him to feel deeper into that experience. Yeah, it's just weird. Uh, and all the movement huh, is exhausting for the body. Yeah. Ooh, exhausting for me. Yeah. Ooh. Mm. It's exhausting to need so much. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. oh. Ooh, and not get it. <laughs> yeah, that's the big part. Stay with it, stay with it, Michael. Throat, really hot. So I'm, I'm going to fast forward a little bit more here towards the end of the session. Um, so from this place, he's able to feel a lot more empathy. He's feeling the safety in the room. He's starting to process these early childhood experiences. And this is going to bring him into another state of dissociation, right? So in order to deal with the incredible amounts of 
um, neglect that he was experiencing, his system developed this dissociation to kind of just be okay. Um, so I'm gonna fast forward to, to that part. Oh, oh, come on. Oh. You're little, and you're in a room by yourself. Oh. You're being thrown back and forth. Oh, nausea. Yeah. Oh. 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 Fucking exhausted. There you go. Let yourself be exhausted. Right, so just notice how that just involuntarily, he's just, system's just shutting down. He's exhausted, and his head starts to kind of droop over, right? So heavy. Heavy? Heavy. Okay, where's the heavy? Whole body. Okay. Mm. Oh, and now I'm really, now I can feel scared that this is going to go on forever. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I don't want it to go on. Yeah. Mm. Oh. No. Uh-huh. Mm. Easy, easy. You got this. You got this. Uh. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to pause there. It gets, it gets a bit more intense. Uh, I think we can spare you for the, that part. So, um, so here he's going into the full experience of that pain, that, those difficult emotions that have been sitting in the subconscious for so long, right? And, um, and finally being in a place and feeling the support to feel those emotions, to let them move through the body, um, that he, as a child, was not able to feel. Um, so I'm gonna, you know, it, this, this escalates a bit more. Um, I'm gonna just fast forward to the very end, right? So that you can just, there's no video, um, but at the very end, you can just hear in his voice, there's a difference, right? He's, something has shifted for him. Um, and I just, it's nice to be able to hear that part. Switch back. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> how how is everybody doing okay? Take it, maybe take a deep breath. A lot of big emotions there. So, 
Yeah. So just notice what kinds of reactions are happening in your nervous system right now. Okay. Notice what it's like to witness this, right? Why it's so important um, for a therapist to be trained and to have done their own work to be able to hold space for these big emotions so that, so that when this is happening that the therapist can, can be present, right? It's so easy to, to be triggered, to be pulled out of the moment. Maybe you felt a little bit sleepy. Maybe you felt tight or anxious. Right? Maybe you're having your own process. So just noticing what's coming up in your system, right? What kinds of things are there? Um, so I want to give thanks to my clinical supervisor, Jen Pfizer, and um, Saj Razvi for their training, for their mentorship, and for all of the work that they've done um, to, to put this model together. Um, I want to thank Sarah Gale for inviting me here to speak to y'all. Um, and I want to thank uh, David Bronner for hosting this. Um, really appreciate it. It's wonderful to be here. And um, to Alyssa Gursky for helping with the slide designs. Um, so, yeah. yeah, open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing this with us. Um, I'm wondering what is, the, uh, at least the range, I imagine it might be different from patient to patient, but um, what dosage are you working with for the cannabis work? You know, typically um, that's, that's something that's kind of decided by each client, but typically the doses are very small. Usually one hit off of a pen, for example, um, is enough. Hi. Um, can you talk about the phenomenon of re-traumatization and re-victimization and traumatic repetition and how this somatic therapy allows patients to process that subconscious material so they don't have to recreate it in their lives to, to deal with it? Definitely. So, um, you know, one of the, the key features of re-traumatization is having an experience where the person um, doesn't have control or doesn't have a solution, right? So trauma happens in the space of no solution. Um, oftentimes, the, the traumas that are stored in the body, um, are there, there's some kind of a solution, right? Like if it's a car accident, um, you know, maybe there's, you know, a, taking a taxi, right? Or um, if it was, you know, something like, um, a, a sexual assault, right? Going places with friends or gradually, you know, finding a safer way of, of dating or something like that, right? Um, so, so there are certain solutions that, that people can, can put in place as adults that maybe weren't in place when they were younger. So that's one aspect. Um, also, having the therapeutic relationship has a big impact on whether that feels you know, re-traumatizing, right? I think it, it would be re-traumatizing if someone started to go into that memory and didn't have the support to go all the way through it, right? Um, so, so having that encouragement and knowing that, um, that there's still some level of choice and control, right? So there's a lot of preparation that goes into this process, making sure that people are aware of what it is that they are getting prepared to do. Um, and, and so each step of the way, there's a lot of consent, a lot of awareness of what this process entails. Um, and and those, those pieces, among a, a lot of others, help to ensure that, that re-traumatization isn't occurring. Is, does that answer your question? So, uh, yeah. What, what strain are people using? So um, the clients bring in, whatever, bring in whatever cannabis product they want to use. So that's 
that's again, you know, so that's one of the, the advantages of cannabis over other medicines, right? Where somebody can try a bunch of different strains and see which works for best for them, what dose works best for them. So, you know, because in, in Colorado, cannabis is recreationally legal, um, you know, that, that is one of the advantages that we have. I just wanted to ask a couple quick questions about the um, clinic itself and how many. Sorry. Oh, I wanted to ask a couple quick questions about the clinic itself and how many people are you seeing per week. Do you guys have any plans for scaling? <laughs> if you have any plans for scaling and um, just, yeah, a little more about the clinic itself because I haven't heard. Last time we were introduced was around the 5MEO research you were doing with, mm -hmm. with Joseph. So this is yeah. new for me to hear about this. I'd love to hear a little bit more. Yeah. So um, so right now the clinic we're we're seeing we have a pretty full caseload. We have um, we have six therapists working, and we have another six that we've just um, started to bring on, and we are in the process of um, bringing our trainings to other states. So we're going to be training licensed therapists in other states. Um, in this modality, so that's something that will be coming up in the next few years, uh, and hopefully that will start to make this more accessible in states where cannabis is legal, um, and then in other states where you know ketamine would be available. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have another question kind of along that line as far as self-care goes. Um, with the intensity of that type of a session, how many of those are you doing in a week or a month? And then what does your self-care routine look like after something like that? Yeah, self-care is extremely important. And, um, I, you know, for me, it's, it was a big part of the learning curve in starting this work. Um, I think, so, after a session like that, um, definitely like taking some time to take, I, I like to take baths, for example. I'm a big fan of baths. Um, I also have, you know, I think it's really important to get involved in something that's, you know, personally relevant and is separate from work. So, um, I'm learning how to paraglide. And for me, that's a way to, you know, to do something different and something that, gets me in touch with my body. Uh, I think, you know, yoga can be really helpful for some people. Um, any kinds of grounding exercises can be great. Um, and, and I think also, you know, as you work with this population, working in the modality, you know, to you kind of, like, tolerance builds up over time. And um, so you kind of learn how to take care of yourself, how to balance all these aspects. Um, and you know it's an ongoing process, and you know, making sure to take vacations and you know come to Burning Man and things like that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, two more questions. Here. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious how much, if at all, you need to work through your clients' past experiences with cannabis, if they've maybe used it in other contexts than a therapeutic one. So sometimes that does come up if, if people have, have used cannabis in other contexts. Um, typically, it doesn't come up unless they had some kind of a negative experience with it. Um, in that case, sometimes we'll do processing of that experience, right? I mean, the, you know, they use cannabis and that brings up the procedural memory of, of that particular time, which, you know, maybe in more recent memory than, you know, something that's deeper in the subconscious. So, um, so, so, just like any other type of traumatic event, I mean, it, it can be processed, and um, and typically the relationship to cannabis changes, right? It doesn't. It, it then it kind of gets assigned this therapeutic place, and we find that people will say like, "I never use cannabis except for in therapy," so um, it kind of gets put in that place of, you know, as a medicine. What 
Um, so we use racemic ketamine, and most clients use a sublingual uh, lozenge. Um, typically, it's 0.5 milligrams per kilogram is the dose. So it's actually quite low dose. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, on average, something around 35 milligrams. Wow. So, yeah, it doesn't really require much. So, yeah. Okay, last question. Yeah, last one. Can you speak a little bit? Yeah. Do, you're, are you saying do are there concerns with clients using these substances outside of therapy? Could could you pass her the microphone? I can't hear. There's this great party going on right here. <laughs> so, like, with uh, increasing acceptance, uh, how are you gonna? sort of inform the public that it's the smaller dosage that have the therapeutic efficacy and not so much the recreational dosages and stuff, sort of keeping people in line with that. Well, um, I'm hoping that me being here can help. That's, that's one step for me is creating talks like this, you know, that people can, can go and talk to their friends about, um, that people can, can be more educated and informed and know that, you know, to say, well, yeah, you know, you have PTSD, but doing a lot of ketamine by yourself isn't going to fix it, you know, um, or, or, you know, smoking, smoking a lot of cannabis isn't going to fix it. it. It may manage the symptoms, and we have to respect that. We have to respect that for some people, that may be where they're at, um, but also knowing that there is the possibility for symptom resolution within the appropriate context. So I think for me, the, the best thing is education, right? Like if, if you can educate your friends, if, um, if, the, if everybody here told five people, you know, that, that the therapeutic benefits are in smaller doses, right? Um, the, the understanding of how these things can be helpful will change. Um, and we can understand the difference between um, using a substance to, to dissociate um, to become unconscious or using a substance to pay more attention and to be supported to feel more. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.